Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am Joe Johnson, and as usual, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello, hello. And Andrew Walker. Andrew, have you come up with a cool nickname yet? Oh, man, I, I have so <laughs> many, but none appropriate for, for radio. I'll your, come up with one one day. That's your homework assignment. <laughs> I mean, we're only five weeks What about you, that. Joe? I'm going to go with Joe Hollywood. That's, uh, uh, I would, that's, have, that's what I'm I would have never guessed that. I should have introduced myself. Never would have Hollywood. guessed it. I'll remember to do that next <laughs> next time. Uh, so we're going to we're going to deviate from the norm a little bit. I think here today. Uh, the title of this podcast is Hollywood Crime Scene, um, but what we're going to talk about today doesn't necessarily have to do with murders and mysteries or anything like that. But it is a fairly controversial and heated topic that uh, directly relates oh, yeah. to the uh, Hollywood people uh, from the golden age of Hollywood and beyond. Um, now, uh, the intro that I came up with for this was uh, we we had a uh, former president, who shall remain nameless, who when uh, was called out uh, to uh, be accountable, he would use the phrase, this is a witch hunt. This is... <laughs> The worst witch hunt in the history of witch hunts. And I would sit there and laugh and go, I think there were worse witch hunts. Uh, number Sa- one on Salem, the list Salem, would like, be like the, the witch hunt. Yeah. Where people <laughs> the <original>. died. <laughs> where people were hung and stoned and, and to death. And burned and, at the stake. <laughs> so I think that would be number one on my list of witch hunts would be the Salem witch trials. And number two with a bullet uh, would be... The blacklist, the Hollywood blacklist, uh, or what they called the Red Scare, uh, that would be number two on my list. And then the other witch hunt that our former president referred to would be way down on that list. <laughs> um, so that's what we're going to talk about today is the Hollywood blacklist and, and the impact that it had on, on the entertainment industry, not just in Hollywood, but all over the country. Uh, where people's livelihoods were taken away from them yeah. because of accusations and innuendo, which is very, very similar to what happened in Salem. Yes. Uh, only in Salem, lives were lost. In Hollywood, uh, jobs and careers were ended. Yep. I don't, you guys Some can correct too. me if I'm wrong, but uh, were lives lost during the Hollywood blacklist? Well, talk about that yeah um but when your livelihood is taken away that makes it tough to make ends meet so um so yeah so i did a little uh research and and looked into it um i'm not as familiar with this topic as i have been with past topics so i'm going to default to you guys to kind of help fill this uh hour um but according to history that i looked up uh the peak of the hollywood blacklist was 46, 47 when things sort of got underway. And obviously it carried through to the 50s. And from what I read, for the most part, it kind of came to an end uh, when Dalton Trumbo, who we're going to talk more about in a little bit, uh, he it was revealed that uh, he was the writer on Spartacus yeah. and had the support of um, uh, Douglas, Kirk yeah. Douglas. Yeah. Uh, now I'm, I've learned some things about Kirk Douglas. I don't know if it's appropriate for this particular podcast, <laughs> but I, I do applaud him for uh, coming to the aid of these blacklist writers and producers and stuff, and and basically bringing an end to this this witch hunt that took place uh, in the '40s and '50s. Uh, some of the prominent names behind uh, this witch hunt uh, was, of course, Ronald Reagan and John Wayne. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, we touched on John Wayne a little bit uh, recently where I, I was watching uh, I Love Lucy uh, where John Wayne appeared on two episodes. One was the final episode of one season and then the first episode of the following season where Lucy steals his footprints from Grauman's Chinese Theater. And there's a comedy of errors where they try to get John Wayne to make new footprints and they keep getting destroyed. And It's one of my all-time favorite episodes. But during... 
uh, that episode, he kept referring to a movie that was in current production at the time. They kept asking, what are you working on, John? Duke? And uh, he said, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a movie called Blood Alley. And I'd always been curious. Like, I've never heard of that movie, Blood Alley. So one day when I was getting uh, DVDs through Netflix, uh, I said, you know what? Let's see if they have Blood Alley. And sure enough, when that, when D- Netflix was doing DVDs, they had everything. Mm-hmm. So I got Blood Alley, and I sat there and watched it. And I almost laughed out loud throughout the movie because it was at the height of the Cold War, and it was so anti-communist that he must have used the word commie 30, 40, 50 times in that movie. We need to get these commies <laughs> off the boat. And I realized watching that movie that the word commie was used the way today the word libtard yes. might be or liberal. It, they weren't necessarily accusing these people of of practicing communism. Russian communism. Right. They were mostly getting attacked because they were liberals they were pro-union and yep. and stuff like that so right. so it was very back then pro workers rights yeah. exactly so back then it was called commies today there's other words for it and made me realize that things haven't changed that much sure. since the uh since the red scare um so ronald reagan of course you know the the republican poster boy was was behind it I was shocked to find out that Walt Disney played a major role in that and mm-hmm. named names and outed his uh, creators and animators, which kind of broke my heart because I had no idea. Um, and yeah. and so yeah, a lot of there were you know big names on both sides. There were the the finger pointers and the accusers, and yeah. then there were the defenders. And uh, I applaud the defenders who said. Um, these people it doesn't matter whether or not they practice communism. It's about being having your livelihood taken away from you because of your beliefs or your practices, which isn't right. So it doesn't matter what you believe; it shouldn't affect your livelihood. And that that was the battle that um, yeah, raged for a decade. the First Amendment. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So imagine those, Pete. What, what yeah. did what did you dig up um, as you were researching this topic? What jumped out at you? Yeah, well, Hollywood Joe, I'd like to first start off uh, to <laughs> tell everyone this. When Joe says that he's just kind of having to do some minor research, this is Joe. We, we have to put this in context. This is Joe we're talking about. Joe's minor <laughs> research is a dissertation for most other people. So I want to just put that out there before uh, Andrew and I start going there. People are like, oh, that sounds like Joe really knows what he's doing. He does. <laughs> no, for us, uh, for me, when we, I was looking at this topic, I – I focused on Ronald Reagan because he was the head of the Screen Actors Guild Union at the time. Uh, this is around 46, 40, 1946, 1947, when the House uh, um, uh, committee, uh, it was the Un-American Committee, mm-hmm. uh, would meet. And he, I've I've read articles in, in the L.A. Times and in the San Jose Mercury News and so, and so on and so forth that have kind of watered down Reagan's involvement, so people who were defending him and then people who basically said, man, this guy was a snitch. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I feel the truth is somewhere in between where he never hid his views on communism. And he would say, I'm against the Soviet form of communism, the, the horror stories you would hear. He would use anecdotal evidence that's saying, hey, I was at certain union meetings. And you would hear people saying, hey, I don't agree with you, union bosses. And all of a sudden they'd snap their fingers and the guy gets let out of there. It's like, what are you doing? And then they'd fi- they'd use filibuster rules like, hey, I have an emotion, I have a motion. Until people just got sick and tired, would leave a meeting. And then they'd find out, hey, the union voted against Harry Truman's proposal, and so it's like Hollywood is against Harry Truman. They're like, wait a minute, you don't speak for the majority of us. So he would use these anecdotal Tactics, pieces, yeah, and yeah. he would, and so he would discuss it, and he had no problem. He, to be fair, he never went to the FBI. The FBI would approach him because he was very open about his anti-communist ways and saying, hey, I don't mind naming names. It's still, you don't have to name names, Ronald. You know, just because someone asks you, you could actually try to have a spine about it and say, well, I, I, I don't mind them saying things. I just don't want them to subvert the Constitution. I'm like, well, that, that's a very slippery slope because they're, you're saying their words are, going, are, in, are attempting to subvert the Constitution. Well, that's, and that's protected in the yes. Constitution. If, yeah. you, if you disagree with them, then challenge them on their views and have an open, honest debate and say, oh, well, wow, you know, hey, your view, you know, we've, we can debate about it. Hmm. Don't try to silence them. And that's where Reagan 
should take fault. You know, and uh, the articles that would defend him would say, you know, they'd bring up, you know, how he spoke. He was a, you know, very anti-racist. You know, he was a, he spoke out against the Ku Klux Klan, and you know, he would say, you know, we should treat people not judging by the, the you know, the, their skin color and all that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, well, that's fine. But then in 1980, you announce your not your campaign at Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers get killed and talk about states' rights. So, Damn. you know, you think about the people that try to defend Reagan when he was saying, oh, he wasn't the, the actual snitch that make him out, people point him out to be. No, he, he did damage. And like you said, Joe, uh, when you get named, uh, Stanford did a study uh, just that came out a, a couple of years ago. Even um, if you w- won an Oscar, you had a 9% drop if you were labeled as working with a you were either a communist you were on the list Mm -hmm. or you were working with trumbo yeah and other a-listers would see anywhere between a 15 to 16 percent drop actors would see a 20 percent drop writers were looking at 13 to 15 percent drop one of them and you know we were talking about the criminal aspect of this so uh actress lee grant and i was she gave a eulogy for j edward bromberg uh and saying that he was on that list, the original, and it said his death was caused by mm. the stress from going through the Red Scare. You know, people not being able to get to work, not being able to, you know, do your, perform your art. Mm. No one would talk to you. Everyone abandoned you. And it was just based on accusations. Right. And yeah. that's what's so scary about that. And again, comparing it to Salem, you pointed a finger and that's then it. you had to defend yourself against really flimsy right. accusations, and it, and it, yeah, ended it was careers, and, and, and it was all character yeah. assass- assassination. Exactly. There was no actual tangible evidence of oh, this person is trying to bring down America, f- you yeah. know, via yeah. radio waves or airwaves. Yeah. I, I think Trumbo had a famous thing. He said, "Show me." He was telling McCarthy, "Show me this evidence, and I'd be glad. I'll gladly." Yeah, talk that's about that, it. that's a basic hallmark of American of American legal system. You know, you can't just throw out stuff and then try yeah. to convince a judge to say, "Hey, this this is a bad person." Yeah, you have to provide hard evidence. The oh, guilty yeah. until proven innocent, and yeah. a yeah. lot of it came from you know they would see a movie and go, "Well, this movie kind of has themes. un-American, uh, yeah, themes or ideals in it," and then it all it would stem from that. And it's like, well, how do you define that? Like, you have a movie that might be pro-union that makes the creator a communist, like. Man, it was just all really flimsy and shoddy evidence. The actress Lee Grant, who I was talking about, when she gave that eulogy saying that, hey, this Red Scare led to the death of my friend, Bromberg, they said, well, and then she refused to testify against her own husband, Arnold Manoff. Mm -hmm. So she got blacklisted for 12 years. Orson Welles was blacklisted because he, uh, uh, something called the Red Channel, a publication, wrote an article saying, you know, radio shows were are also a place where people can do stuff, and Orson Welles was notoriously famous for having radio broadcasts and everything on top of You don't great say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he was blacklisted for a while. And, uh, yeah, I think what I – you can see me checking out this real note here. Uh, Joe mentioned this. Uh, there are certain Hollywood actors and directors who formed a committee. I think it was – I think I have the name here. The Committee of the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. And they went to D.C. and said, hey, listen – you may not agree with the Hollywood 10, but they have a right to say it, and we're here to fight for that right to say it. And it, this this committee had, you know, Bogart, Hepburn, Groucho Marx, Lucille Ball. Yeah, and I, I wanted to make yeah. sure to emphasize that, you know, part of the, the blacklist thing was naming names. And yeah. I want to name names right now because <laughs> yeah. I want to give credit to the people who were responsible for protecting the rights of these creators. Right. Uh, you mentioned some of them, but uh, John Huston, the, the yep. great director, yep. uh, Bogart Bacall, Judy Garland, Danny Kaye. Um, these were people who fought for the rights of these creators. So they, I want to applaud them. And, and it's, a, it's, in my opinion, a very brave uh, and useful use of celebrity. Mm-hmm. You're you're in a you're in a position of power. You're sort of a middleman between the working class audience and the wealthy executives. Right. And you're trying to say, hey, let's pump the brakes a little bit. This this is not going to go the way you think it is. Yeah, yeah. you're going to end up hurting a lot of people, possibly getting people killed. You're yeah. because you're right because of your yeah. I- ignorant rhetoric. Now, I you mentioned a name briefly. I want to expand on that a little bit. Um, 
there was a very, very famous person who got caught up in the Red Scare, probably the most famous face in the history of the world. Um, I've read articles that said that more people in the history of the world has have seen the face of Lucille Ball more than any other person alive. And people would counter and say, well, no, Jesus is more famous. Well, how many people saw Jesus's face? Yeah. Not Does a lot anyone of people know, have seen. Look, know what he looks like? What right, about, exactly. I think the only other person might be Elvis. Yeah, yeah. On, I mean, that. I, I think she'd be on that level. Yeah. Wow. And, and because I Love Lucy has been in reruns all over the world for such a long time that more people have seen her face than anyone else, to think she got caught up in the Red Scare and her career was in jeopardy. And the story goes, I, I read her um, her autobiography. Right. She wrote an autobiography that got published posthumously uh, where she said that her grandfather, who pretty much raised her after her father died, uh, was a communist. And he would hold little meetings in the garage and stuff like that. And when she was young and it came time for her to vote, her grandfather urged her to register as a communist. And she didn't know the difference between communism and republicanism and, and demo, uh, Democrats. Yeah, she was probably she, pretty, she kinda, pretty young, right? Probably yeah. Like I mean, 18, 19, 20, yeah. probably. And so she just kind of appeased her grandfather to make him happy. Well, somebody went digging for dirt, probably Hedda Hopper, because Hedda Hopper was the lead witch hunter. <laughs> and... um. So she, Lucy said she was listening to a, a radio broadcast or something, and they did this little teaser, like, which famous redhead is a red, you know? And she's like, ooh, I'd like to hear this, you know? <laughs> and then it, it was brought to her attention that they were talking about her, and she was like, oh, no, I'm done. And I read that uh, Desi Arnaz, her husband, appealed to J. Edgar Hoover himself and said, my wife is not a communist. Here's what happened. And J. Edgar Hoover went public and cleared her name. But wow. she, her career could have been over um, because of people digging for dirt and pointing fingers and making accusations. And That's the 50s version of, of going through your Twitter feed. Your Facebook. <laughs> That's right. Hey, back in 2013. <laughs> Lucy Oval tweeted. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I knew I knew that she had been accused of of yeah. leftist sympathies. I didn't know I didn't know the anecdote about uh, Desi trying <laughs> to personally intervene. Yeah, but you have to. Think. That's 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 pretty amazing yeah. to have such a a hard ass like J. Edgar Hoover publicly do a one eighty. <laughs> uh, I I guess I have to. I mean, as much as I hate that guy, I mean, <laughs> at least that's one thing. Well, I, I mean, don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, let's also see. You wonder what concessions he might have squeezed out of Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, saying, "Hey, maybe next time when we need someone, right, don't speak out about us, you know, going after people." Hey, hey, or hey, I think possibly because yeah, this would have been the perfect time. Hey, you uppity Cuban, <laughs> you, you, you're not going to are do, your papers in order. <laughs> yeah, you're not. You, well, you're not going to say anything uh, in favor of Castro now, because that also that yeah. was the right. same time, late fifties. Right. Right. Yeah. But also, I think what well, might have what, played she, a role in this. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was she accused earlier? Like, like about what, what I, I, time frame? I, I want to say in the 50s, but I'm yeah. not positive. Okay. I don't have the date in front of me, but I think it was in the 50s where she was pretty famous and married to Desi at this point. Okay. But, but, Andy, um, do, you, but do you guys think it had an effect? Like, even if uh, Jager comes out and clears him, you know, it's like after you let it marinate for about a month or two and then say, Jen and Hoover comes and says, hey, She's clear. And you go, wow, the, the clearing part was like a little blurb that came out. Well, here's here's my theory. I think that had these accusations been made against this incredibly famous person, maybe it would have turned the tide and had America thinking, well, wait a second, maybe we need to rethink this. Right. So maybe that's why they felt like they needed to say, okay, she's different. You she's know what? not like that's, the others. That's I, a really good point because yeah. they say, well, if it's Lucy, <laughs> exactly. Can't be that America's bad. housewife, you know, yeah, yeah. So, so she got caught up in that, and uh, yeah. So, think about the 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 f most famous people that got caught up in this uh, this witch hunt. It, it's scary to think that it could happen. If it could happen to Lucy, it could happen to anybody. Sure. But the concept of the witch hunt still exists in Hollywood, right? I mean, you think about after when nine eleven happened, because we just you know, yeah. And then you know the there were so many songs that were censored. Yeah, I mean not even Hollywood, but on FM radio. 
And then anyone that disagreed with the subsequent war in Iraq, because, hey, it had to be tied to 9-11, like the Dixie <laughs> Chicks were notoriously blacklisted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they said, they said we're embarrassed that uh, W uh, is from Texas, right. the same state that they were from, and their career ended. Yep. Ended with were, that comment. They were they were extremely hot in two thousand two, two thousand three. Right. But the moment they opened their mouth about Iraq, yeah. and not because they, they were pro nine eleven, they no, were just anti war. No, exactly. no uh, maybe three thousand people in the world were actually pro nine eleven, right. and I think they might have been <laughs> right done with in Afghanistan or whatever. Yeah, yeah. but. But no, your point is, yeah, yeah it still continues to this day, yeah. and and it's the liberal, you know, liberal elite Hollywood versus, um, you know, the the Trump supporting Republicans, and it's it's still happening both ways. I mean, depending on what your beliefs are, but you, you know, they use the term woke or canceled today. Uh, it's no different than what was happening uh, 50, 60, 70 it's, years it, ago. I think it's just another example of uh, culture proxy wars being fought in places where maybe they shouldn't be fought i would say it's worse now though right because it happens so much faster right the, and we don't yeah. have time to process things and yeah. to get over things in a healthy way because of the media i mean but do you think desi could have it, had this happened now do you it, had twitter and facebook and, and tiktok and all that existed back in 1950 do you think desi would have had a chance to get ahead of this only, only if he, no, they would have been reacting yeah, yeah. instead of being even hoover, hoover yeah. like what do you want me to say man i go out <laughs> there they're like it's a fake account yeah, yeah. That's not really Hoover. <laughs> it, it, it's a character actor. Yeah, that's right. Right? You get the Alex Jones type. Stuff, they're like, that's not really the Jagger, Jagger it's Hoover. A hoax. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, still, still happening today. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what needs to be done to for all of us to get together on this. And you know, one one thing that I really hate is is when uh, critics will tell a, a, a celebrity, an actor, or an athlete. Uh, shut up and act or shut job, up and play yeah. basketball. I don't agree with that. It, they have a a podium. They have a pulpit where they can speak to their followers, their fans. How dare people tell them that they shouldn't take advantage of that? I wish I had people right. caring what I said. I would I would use that. So I don't think they should shut up and stick to their job. Right. They're no. voters. They're Americans. Uh, they have every right to say what they want I mean, to could say. you imagine, shut up and be a plumber. Yeah. You're a plumber. You plumb. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? Yes. laughs> yeah. You're a carpenter. You do, you know, you're an electrician. Yeah. You're a machinist. You're, you're a bartender. Yeah, I, I, Who care, you I, know? I think the, the the main thing is using uh, whatever negative stereotype about that person's position is yeah. as a cover for subconsciously subconsciously saying, oh well, I I think uh, you're kind or you're getting kind of uppity, you know. Uh, why are you guys protesting in the streets? You know, just act, just you know. Even, and even really, protesting. when people when you hear people either in public or in per in in person say consistently say things like that you're like oh you don't dislike them because they're an actor or a basketball player there's something deeper going on there. right yeah exactly. and that's that implicit that subconscious implicit passive aggressive shit is what today we're trying to deal with you know because people are trying to be smarter and trying to hide their whatever negative ism yeah and couch it in different terms but well, let's let's talk about the Oscars. You know, a, yeah. a lot of actors are criticized for using uh, their acceptance speech to, uh, you know, push some agenda or whatever. And again, millions, if not a billion, people are watching the Oscars. That's your opportunity to say something that is close to you, is important to you. You have this audience watching you, and yes, I have to admit that as a viewer, you kind of roll your eyes when. You know, person after person after person makes some sort of a statement. But can you really blame them? Can you blame them to be given a minute or two minutes with a billion eyes on you? And it uh, also depends, right? When you get someone from when it's someone from 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 another nation that that you know if they come from Mexico and they're talking about the kidnappings and they want to speak about that, then you go, okay, well, you know, sure, they come from, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they escape North Korea and they 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 make a movie and they want to talk about it. You might listen to that compared to, I guess, you know, how people treat, you know, George Clooney. He comes in and like, you know, we are the Hollywood elite and uh, we just want to talk. And you're like, oh, George, easy. You grew up here. At least they came from a place that experienced direct hardship. So we'll give them 
we won't do the eye roll as much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a platform. Use it. You applaud them for using it. How they then you go like, okay, please God, come on, I'm with you. But now we're three minutes, and now you're going. I think it's the quality of what you're going to say. I think they. You know, Joe, let me ask you something. If you had the opportunity, like you get nominated, let's say you get nominated for, an, I'm going to pick editing. Okay. You're, and you say, okay, wow, I'm, I'm in the editing category. I got 30 seconds because John Williams <laughs> plays me off. So you so you know in your head, I got 30 seconds. This is what I'm going to say. Yeah. And hopefully you say it. Instead, you know, where you start rattling on and on. You know, first of all, I want to get to Yeah. You know, there, there's something to that. Yeah. I, now, it, it, my thing is, like, when I watched the last Oscar ceremony, I felt like, the more, the bigger the award, the more I would concede, okay, say what you got to say. But when someone would win an Oscar for, you know, best sound yeah. editing or right. sound mixing or whatever, and they're up there talking about something, it's like, just get your award and let's keep the show moving. And maybe that's not fair. I don't know. But... Or keep it, or keep, <laughs> be, be aware that you have 30 seconds, thank yeah. who you want to thank, and then say, listen, I, I stand with the people of so and so, you know, yeah. whether it's Israel, it's Palestine, whatever. I stand with the people of so and so, and say, okay, then because they're going to interview you behind stage, yeah, and so, someone's going to talk to you, yeah. So then you just go expound on it there, and and everybody is going to put on social media and news like, oh, this person spoke up for this group right. of people or whatever, and I think a lot of it is length and also being if if you're being like overly preachy, yes. Your, your the tone, the way you come across. You're all of a sudden yeah. going to – you're, of course, have turned off more, more so likely uh, conservative people watching it. Yeah. But even more people who might think like you might say, all right, buddy, let's – okay. Clooney had that <laughs> we infamous it. speech, right, that even South Park made fun of was like, you know, we are the elite. It's like, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> you actually said that? Like, oh, George. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of it's just people being so, uh, not self-aware about certain things. Right. And, yeah. And here's something I am sitting here thinking about. You know, we say that a lot of this is still happening today, yeah. what was happening in Hollywood, you know, 60, 70 years ago. But I feel like the, the tide's kind of shifted a little bit, if, if that's the right analogy. But think about, you know, when this was happening, late 40s, 50s. Yeah. You had, you know, your John Wayne's, Ronald Reagan's, Walt Disney's, who were, you know, espousing, is that the right word, uh, American ideals and values. Uber patriots. Today... Those people are Scott Baio, Kevin Sorbo, uh, what's her name from The Mandalorian. And <laughs> they're being kind of mocked and ridiculed as being out of touch and almost borderline nuts. So what happened? What happened in those 50, 60, 70 years where where they kind of felt like they were speaking for the majority of Americans now seem to be speaking on a small vocal minority it's kind of interesting to see that shift that's happened over the decades yeah i i i think um maybe people like scott bayo and who, who else did you say kevin, kevin sorbo, sorbo. Uh, Be- yeah. people who have been steven seagal <laughs> people who have been uh, out of touch i guess with uh, you consider mainstream uh within their career probably the last 20 whatever 20 years for those guys and you have to n- wonder like okay are they just doing this to get attention or do they really have these hard political views or are they just kind of nuts it's got to be one, <laughs> some of them one, might. Some one of, of them the might. three or A combination two, yeah, yeah. two of the three for what's her name uh gina carano from mandalorian yeah. yeah yeah she she was in a very she had the opposite she was in a very good spot yeah the opposite way of like kevin sorbo or whatever on one of the hottest new TV shows, uh, I I liked her character. I think a lot of people did. Yeah. Um, but she she didn't know when to keep her mouth shut on I guess trans issues or gay issues, pronouns, whatever. And so, vaccines so, too. I think yeah, she so was like just, anti-vaccine. Yeah. And I I just read a couple of her tweets here and there, and I thought, honey, you, just stop. But I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna play devil's advocate right. here because here we are talking about. The, the blacklist in the 40s and 50s where people lost their livelihood because of their beliefs or, or whatever. Today, people like Gina Carano, is, is, she yeah, lost her turned. livelihood yeah. because she s- vocalized what she believed. And how is that yeah, different? It's, now, I might not necessarily agree with her, right? but how is her suffering the consequences of 
freedom of speech is different than what happened in the forties and fifties. I, I think in the particular thing, the particular difference is in the forties and fifties, it came from top down from the state, <laughs> from the federal government. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. Threatening people with possible jail time yeah, if you don't or deportation. Yeah, if you don't comply with you, you know coming to Congress. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, let's, so that's a good point. versus uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, uh, tabloid level. Yeah. Mo- you know, a lot of the time, just yeah, I think uh, surf- you, surface level. That's a really stuff. good point. Back then, there's legality involved. Here, it's just basically, you, would you lose the sponsorship money? Right, and 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 the way I view it is, uh, when when you you're such a high pro- profile person like a a, a, a sports celebrity or movie star musical artist um your your audience pays your livelihood mm-hmm. right so that would be like if if we went into one of our jobs and started just acting against everything your company stands for or you do something that, yeah, that makes the company flex, yeah right lose uh three million dollars next quarter <laughs> you're gonna have consequences now yeah. The the I think the most civil thing we can talk about is does a punishment fit the crime? Right, right. Like if somebody said a bad word thirteen years ago on Twitter, sh- should we say, "Hey, man, no, yeah, I, we're 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 gonna we're gonna blacklist you"? But if somebody has been credibly accused of sexually harassing forty six women, we might need to, pu- you know, possibly pump the brakes. Yeah, so right. you know we gotta. Yeah, there's a difference. We gotta have a, a, a decent yeah. understanding of stuff. Well, look at it this way: Clint Eastwood, very fir- you know, you could say that you know he he's on the conservative end, and but his work speaks for itself. Right. Uh, but it's really tough to say. So am I not supposed to? I love Where Eagles Dare. I love Kelly's Heroes. Mm-hmm. Those are movies I grew up watching. He he he's really conservative conservative, but I don't think he's. Uh, like a jerk about it. He's stubborn. He's a stubborn old dude, but he's I mean, not. He tried, a, he tried doing the chair thing, which is kind of weird. That, <laughs> right. That, I mean, that was, that Talking was, to an that, empty that chair. was dumb. Yeah. And uh, some of his more recent movies, you know, like, okay, maybe he's over glorifying, glorifying things like maybe with American Sniper. And, yeah. Sure. But I don't think he's the kind of guy that would try to ruin other people if somebody was liberal. Like a lot of the people that have been in his recent movies are. Hardcore liberals. Uh, yeah. Olivia Wilde was in the yeah. bo- the movie about the bomber in Atlanta. Yeah. I didn't yeah. see it, but I heard it was decent. Yeah, it was, it was a good movie. So uh, Clint, I think Clint Eastwood is still a, a decent example of gl- an old, stubborn, conservative guy in Hollywood. But they would try who, to cancel him, right? The current crowd would say, oh, my God, look what he's trying I, to do. I, I, I heard some. I don't know if I heard it. people trying to cancel him. But I could be and, wrong. And he's almost untouchable. I mean, yeah. his track record. I mean, yeah. if or he got like, canceled today, what impact would that have on his career sure. and his body of work? You know, sure. or, or John Voight, maybe. John Voight, yeah. who has a very famous liberal considered daughter in, in, in Angela yes. and Jolie. But John Voight has done great work. But, yeah. you know, he's got his views. And, and I, I think of a, a lot of it, especially in Hollywood and a lot of other high-profile places, high-powered places, um, as long as you don't... S- snipe too many people behind the scenes yeah you know they can still keep a, a certain sort of relationship with you yeah um i think that has a lot to do with it you know too. Be- i don't think eastwood has sniped too many people like, that we know of, that, we, that we know of well yeah, i'd yeah. be very interested to get your both your opinions on this the, the ability to compartmentalize oh yes where you could disagree with someone's views joe like you were saying but say i appreciate the art that they did. Yeah. You know, God forbid, I'm not saying this happened, but oh my God, I think I made this com- some similar comment before. Vincent Van Gogh poisoned school children. <laughs> but you go to the <laughs> Van Gogh exhibit and you're like, oh my God, this is such beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah, monster. Sure. yeah we talked about that uh, episode or two ago about yeah. whether or not uh, a person's uh, personal failings affect uh, their right. body of work and, and whether it alters that. And for me personally, if we're slightly apart, and this applies to friends and family too, if we're slightly apart, I think you can reach a consensus and have a, an intelligent discussion. But yes. when you start talking about the fringes, the far left and the far right, I'm not going to go one way or the other. There's there's fringes on both sides. That's when you start questioning, like, do I want to continue to have this relationship with this person? Absolutely. Because they're so far out there. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. It's all At the end of the day, it's... What are all of us willing to tolerate? Yeah, exactly. So, right. yeah. Now, but 
uh, just one last thing because there was uh, one movie that I wanted to mention, and this will only be a minute. Um, but talking about separating art from the artist, um, Woody Allen, who I think has made some excellent movies, yeah. uh, especially in the uh, 70s and 80s. He starred in a movie, but he it was one of the rare ones that he didn't write and direct, and it was called The Front from 1976. Huh. I've never heard and of it. And it has to do – yeah, it wasn't popular, and, of course, it wasn't as good as you know if, if he would have written it and directed right. it. Um, actually, I – I had not seen it. My dad had mentioned it to me, and he's like, yeah, it's okay. I mentioned to him, hey, yeah, I'm going to do a podcast on this topic, on the Red Scare. He's like, yeah, I remember seeing this when I was a young man. Just like, he said it just like Woody Allen. You know, <laughs> I, I, the only reason I saw it was because Woody was in it. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to bring that up because I read about it, and it seems to be a decent movie. It's not as, I guess, as funny as his typical movies, right. but there's... He, of course, he he can't not be comedic in whatever he does. So anyway, it's called the Front from '76. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, a, a little while ago, you you used the phrase, uh, "Does the punishment fit the crime?" And that got me thinking uh, about Dalton Trumbo. Right. Uh, and and since you just promoted a movie, I'm going to promote the movie please, Trumbo. Please do. Uh, yes. Trumbo, I saw in theaters, and I really, really enjoyed it, and I think it deserved more. Oscar recognition than it got. Brian Cranston was, I thought, yeah, amazing was as yeah. Trumbo. Um, and so I was curious, and I, I, I like uh, searching for websites that take uh, historical uh, Hollywood movies and call them out. And, and you know, I, we call it fact versus fiction, which which movies uh, are, are factually more accurate than others. And so I did that for Trumbo. I was like, Trumbo, fact versus fiction. What I found out is that Trumbo's daughters uh, were instrumental and in, in adamant about telling an accurate story in that picture. So they, the movie is very, very accurate, other than streamlining a little bit to just tell a more you right. know, uh, st- articulate story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the one thing that's so shocking about not just the movie but uh, Trumbo in real life is that he was jailed for 11 months went to prison and and earlier you mentioned that you know one of the differences between now and then is it came down from the government right yes. that yes. he was forced to testify and when he refused to answer their questions and refused to admit whether he was a communist he was jailed on contempt uh, it's, that's it, it's so ex- shocking I, to me i don't I don't know what's we how more un-American you can get with yeah. something like that. Yeah, what a it's, bad lawyer! It's pretty sick. Yeah, well, oh, that too. what a bad defense team. Yeah. But then there's a great line when he's in prison and he ran into some politician who was part of the you know the blacklist uh, uh, group there, and the politician was like, "Well, well, well, look at we're both in the same prison and." Trumbo supposedly said, yes, but only one of us committed a crime. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was such a great line. He, yeah. The, the little bit I know about him, I've read about him. I haven't seen the movie, but it's, he seemed like a brave dude. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, and, and he had some snappy comebacks with, uh, with a lot of stuff. Oh, so, with McCarthy. Yeah. Extremely intelligent dude. And yeah, he, he, he should be viewed, I think more as a, as a hero for uh, free speech than, well, I think he was redeemed. He was redeemed later because uh, there were two movies, and I don't have it here in front of me, but there were two movies that he wrote that were uh, were Oscar winners, I believe. But other people got the credit because he wasn't able to put his name on those movies. He later was recognized. The the Academy was able to present him with an Oscar in his lifetime for one of those movies. And then I think he was credited posthumously for another movie. Uh, And then, of course, there was Spartacus, you know. I I haven't seen the movie, but I read he he did get credit for uh, Exodus with Paul Newman. Yes. It came out in 1960, which I don't know anything about. I definitely haven't seen it. But maybe is it more like a Ten Commandments type I have no, no idea. No, no, no. See that? Uh, not, not, not I have that no. I have. I don't know anything about it. I just came across the title. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh no. I, I, into that. I, it, it, I. It's been so long. I have no idea. I probably so, have to rewatch that movie. That, despite I mean, that's... everything that he went through, I think he history has vindicated him, and obviously, 
America looks a lot more lightly on your political beliefs and whether or not that should a- a- affect your livelihood. But uh, like I said, it's it's still happening today. Right. I and I I think a, a big lesson here to, to that we can apply is um, we can't let the state legislate speech like they tried to do in that um, no and, 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 it goes both right, ways both, yeah. both both sides but also we need to apply that to social media and not try to be a scold about everything and then a, in our personal lives of well, course that's, and just be more chill about stuff i mean it's interesting <laughs> though because now they're appointing committees that monitor speech for these social media platforms right and, and I, those are the, the next level that things was kind of like what are you guys doing giving this random group of individuals power to censor whose posts on right. what social media and is considered i i think we'll eventually see reforms in that area because i'm hoping i mean if you think about it and the, the arc of history there are always whistleblowers that will be like sure hey let's pump the brakes on this i <laughs> i just got fired from this company i have receipts uh, like with uh, recently in the last two days with uh, Twitter, have you guys read about that? Uh, one of the guys who got fired was saying, "Hey, there are people that can hide that work there who can hijack any account and pretend they're a famous verified person." Oh wow! So I mean, I mean that makes it's, sense because you're at the you're at the nerve center. <laughs> so yeah, right. I, hopefully, That's let's terrifying. cross our fingers and pray that this brings about reform sure. against the big tech companies too. Well, you know, Joe, and you guys mentioned this something about you know stuff being uh, deemed a crime when you're talking about speech now if you protest they could say well this protest even if you have a permit is now considered disturbing the peace so you guys are out that's a crime you're disturbing the peace yeah a cop a police can use that for anything like yeah okay that person says you're disturbing them so you're out so yep their feelings trump your rights yeah so it's 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 very sketchy times right now right well like with, people like with anything protests. you, you, you got to make sure you don't uh rub the authorities the wrong way or they will come down on you but sometimes you know sometimes you gotta snip at their heels a little bit you know, oh to, yeah to move to move things along you know yeah i uh had a footnote on on john wayne you know obviously he was the driving force behind behind the house on uh, on american activities commission and all that um but even <laughs> even john wayne wouldn't cross a line and when i saw this this sort of made me laugh so he was he was so uh, well known for his anti-communism stance that Soviet leader Joseph Stalin said that he should have been assassinated for his views despite the fact that Stalin was a fan of his movies um, but uh, John Wayne was a member of the John Birch Society and oh, I'll have boy. to look up more information about that but he left the organization when they uh, announced that a uh, Florida, I'm going to pronounce this correctly, fluoridation of water uh, was a communist plot. <laughs> and John Wayne said, all right, uh, maybe these guys are a little too far right. off there. It's kind of like the uh, the general in uh, Dr. Strangelove. Oh, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, okay, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Take it down. And well, that's, yeah. that's like someone with Alex Jones. I was with you with the Lizardmen. Chemtrails? No. <laughs> I can't go with you on that. No. That's right. Lizardmen, you yes. Had, you had me at, yeah. Um, another thing I was surprised to learn is – and and it's funny, you know, with these podcasts we're doing, some names keep coming up over and over. And on a recent uh, podcast we did about uh, organized crime in, in uh, L.A., uh, a name came up, uh, William Wilkerson, who uh, he he owned Ciro's, which is now the comedy store. Uh, yeah, and he yep. started construction on the Flamingo in Vegas. Uh, which then was taken over by Bugsy Siegel. Uh, And he also founded The Hollywood Reporter, and basically he's credited with starting this whole blacklist thing because he had that trade newspaper where he could say whatever he wanted with no repercussion, and he probably skimmed lawsuits by not necessarily naming names, but like I said with, with Lucy, you know, what? well-known redhead, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. As long as the question, the whole Rush Limbaugh defense, <laughs> I'm, I didn't say that you yeah. were a demon. What but, if you were yeah. a demon? It's, it's plausible deniability. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So William Wilkerson uh, kind of opened the floodgates and everything came from that. So that was a little interesting uh, tidbit that I learned as we I were mean, doing but our y- research. You both are right, though. Crimes were committed. 
people lost their jobs. People, whether they, it led to indirectly to their depression, death, it ruined lives. People could no longer go there. I mean, oh yeah, it, it doesn't always have to be murder, like you said. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, I mean, it was definitely a, a crime and with with an intent, yeah, to cause whether reputational or social or and political you, harm. Ex- and you know, this this was almost I feel and it's a little bit of a stretch, but it kind of applies. This was kind of like Hollywood. How Afghans how Afghanistan pe- people would say, oh, they're part of Al Qaeda, and then mm-hmm. we would take them out and put them yep. in Abu Ghraib or, or rendition them elsewhere. Oh, just because they were getting rid of personal it, vendettas. It right? was oh yeah. And so if somebody yep. in the Hollywood Reporter said, you know what, I don't like that producer, Kami. Oh sure, you know there's a <laughs> lot of that stuff going on. You know, especially like the women. You know, the the women in Hollywood, if they were if they were confident, if they were independent. They were labeled nut jobs, and you know, I, again, this is something else we talked about in the past. Catherine Hepburn yeah. was labeled uh, box office poison because why? She she wore trousers and was independent. <laughs> yeah. So there was a lot of that going on, like trying to, uh, you know, sully somebody's reputation because Be- maybe she spurned your advances, right? Or yeah. Like yeah. some sort of deep subconscious psychological yeah. thing about seeing one image of somebody in it, you know, oh. I don't like that person. Yeah, but this all she, played you know, in. The, she's wearing that. <laughs> exactly. This all play, the Hollywood uh, the Hollywood Red Scare contributed to when Hollywood. We were talking about the golden age of Hollywood. When it started off, you had a lot more women actors, yes. women yeah. writers, women directors in the twenties and thirties, and all of a sudden you get right there's that three decade part where you're like, where did all the women go? Yeah, and positions of power. <sighs> exactly. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something else out with. Uh, we got about ten or so minutes left. Um. One of the things that, you know, these, these Hollywood conservatives were afraid of back then were, were these messages that were embedded in these movies. What impact do you think these movies would have had on America as a society? Like, they put, I think they put too much weight in movies having an impact on the way people thought, I guess. But, I mean, I could cite examples, and this is kind of a silly example, but let's, let's take a look at Saturday Night Fever. So Saturday Night Fever was was a a newspaper article, which I guess found out later it was mostly fictitious. But supposedly this article, magazine article or whatever, was talking about the nightlife in some small part of New York or whatever where people wear gold chains and go disco dancing and, and stuff like that. And they turned that into a movie. And what was originally just what was supposed to be a small faction of people who did this, this movie comes out, and what happens? People all over America start wearing the, the collars and the gold chains and go out and start disco dancing, and the Bee Gees blow up and all this. So movies can have an impact. Absolutely. But I think it's more on pop culture and stuff like that. Were they giving movies too much credit um, in brainwashing Americans to vote communist or to vote liberal or what? What are your, what's your take on that? I I think they did because if you look at I've I've seen articles I've seen uh, uh, reports that people cite the oh we didn't do a good enough job in the late from forty seven to sixties are basically the years of the red scares I think they looked at. had we done a better job. Those themes and messages from those movies would not have given rise to the hippies of the 60s and 70s and the mm-hmm. counterculture where everybody was against the government. They were anti-war. We were trying to stop the communists from sp- communists from spreading in Vietnam, and it's these guys that 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 broke us. You know, we were trying to do in Korea. They were trying to, you know, mm-hmm. and and then look what happened. You had the 60s and 70s where America was down. You know, everything was bad. Then Reagan comes in the 80s, and it's <laughs> America's on the comeback. <laughs> And you kind of think, yeah, they were trying to sully movies like everything in the 70s, like the good guy, the anti hero. Yeah. Uh, what's Hollywood trying Easy to say about writer, America? That yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it can. People, I could see conservatives, they, and they use that. They said, we didn't do a good enough job. Had we listened to John? Had we listened to Walt? Mm-hmm. Had we listened to, you know, uh, Ronnie? We probably might have st- nipped this in the bud, but look what happened. Hmm. Look at that generation. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always I, I hear the term, you know, pre-code, uh, the Hayes Code in Hollywood, where mm-hmm. you know you couldn't see a, a married couple share a bed. I just watched a movie recently where the husband and wife were in separate beds, and I'm like, really? Um, I always wondered, like, if there wasn't a Hayes Code at the time, what would have been the direction of movies? Because they got 
they got pretty saucy. They got pretty racy there. And then the Hays Code stepped in and really cracked down on things. And it kind of made filmmakers more creative on how to yeah. depict sex. Like it was off camera. You'd see a yeah. train enter a tunnel more, or yeah, something. Yeah, more, more creative. And... So you got to wonder if the restrictions that, you know, the Hollywood conservatives at the time and the Hays Code and all that put on these movies – were there still ways to get your message out and be more oh, yeah. subtle about it? Yeah. If you're if you're a true creative, you can. That's right. If you're, how how good of a writer and visual artist are you? That that's what it comes down to. But you're trying to convey a subtle message. What were, what were some of those? If you play the record backwards, you can hear a message. It's devil music. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And we're going to talk about influence of commie movies. After both my grandpas saw It's a Wonderful Life, they immediately started voting communist. Yeah. Because, because that bank was was oh, oh man Potter, <laughs> let's kill him. You, you, you've, you've heard of that that yeah. that film was the FBI did apparently look into that film. Oh yeah, looking it was back definitely on definitely anti-capitalism. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's, it's just funny to, funny to think about. I, I've seen absurd takes of saying that. Garland's ruby slippers was a red nod to yes. communism. And you go, what in the love of... It's rubies, guys. What color yeah. are rubies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was to take advantage of the technicolor process that had recently been invented. So Her, her, yeah. her slippers were in the story silver. Am I correct? Yeah, originally they were silver. And then, like I said, to take advantage of the new yeah. technicolor process. They needed process, a, a they red that. So, to pop. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure there was a lot of that where the conservatives were finding... Things that they were squinting and looking for. Trying to find. If I squint real hard, I can see see communist manifesto. I see a face in the wall. It's Jesus. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, this is. uh, No, Joe, uh, yeah. uh, Movies can influence. I think movies. And they almost. They they should be able to. Yeah, they should be able to. You go there to see, like, it's a commentary on what's what creators think is happening at their. At at the time. You can disagree. You can agree with it. it. yeah, in some ways they're they're time capsules where yeah. they're uh, capturing a specific mood and look and feel of the time. But other times, movies create that. They oh yeah, they create what comes next. I I find it fascinating, and that's why I have such a love of film. Is is I don't think people realize the impact that films have on on pop culture and America and society and and stuff like that. But I still feel that the conservatives of the blacklist era were, were giving films a little too much credit in being able to subvert young yeah. minds. People are going to make their decision one Music, way or another. video games, yeah, and, and in movies and television. It has to yeah. be them. It can't be anything else. Yeah, they get <laughs> blamed for all of society. Violent video skills. games for shooters. Uh, <laughs> one, one last point I wanted to make, um, and I'll just be brief. Uh, I was thinking about the broader worldwide social political climate at that time is right after world war ii yeah and so people a lot of the people who were uh in hollywood just a couple years earlier were fighting in the atlantic or pacific and pacific so a lot of people were still trying to process what was going on so you also you know you have to take everything into account when we look back on the things and like wow that was a no, no one alive in America today went through what you know those people went through mm-hmm. uh, po- during that World War II, and then immediately the rapid social change that happened afterward. I'm not trying to excuse no what, what yeah, these yeah. jerks did, but yeah, uh, and and also I think the the hard anti-communist thing was also a s- sort of uh, domestic react counter reaction of what was happening. Uh, on the world stage, the USS versus yeah. US, USSR after yeah, World yeah. War II. And then four years later, uh, after the Chinese Civil War, when the communists won there, yeah. people were paranoid about China yeah. because of, they were communists. So I think there was a semi-entertainment uh, industry social proxy war going on in America that maybe kind of reflected what was going on in the world, possibly. That, that, that's... A possible influence. You know, you both made made an excellent point. I'll try to be quick about this. That after the war ended, when it became U.S. versus USSR for the space race, we were more willing to take former Nazis into the space program yes. rather than someone being accused of com- communism. Oh, like, right. oh that's signed, <laughs> and that changed that's in the crazy. '80s with or '90s with, with the U.S. Russian space station. Right. Think about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Joe, you were talking about when when Kennedy said we want to go to the moon. 
1960. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, you saw a lot of Lost in Space. You saw a lot of sh- TV Sci- and movies. Sci-fi science- came in hard yeah. Yeah. in the 60s. I think, I yeah. think Neil deGrasse. Twilight Zone. Think Twilight Zone yeah. is a perfect example. Yeah. So you could say, it, it, it also say, hey, we got to beat the Russians into space. So then everything, education, entertainment, everything became about let's get there. Yeah, just to fire people yeah. up. Yeah. I think the closest thing that my generation has experienced along the lines of what you were just talking about um, is, is uh, 9-11. You know, we all went through 9-11 together, and there was that Muslim backlash. Oh. Yeah. And I remember at my previous job uh, at a, a public access TV studio, I invited some representatives of the Muslim Unity Center to come in. And uh, this was within weeks of, of 9-11. And I wanted to give them an opportunity to say, we don't value death more than life. Because that's something I had read in the wake of 9-11. Uh, was that all oh, these Muslims, you know, they, they value death more than life. And they came in and said, that's not true. We love life. Yes. We love people. Yes. We're all about peace. The people that perpetrated that act uh, are not like us. They're extremists. And so, so yeah, we, we kind of experienced that. And, and, and I, I used the tools that I had to try to give them a voice and say, let's not retaliate against that's an right. entire race or religion. Yep. Hey, um, I'm I'm an Indian Hindu. So <laughs> when, I, when I grow this out, if I go to the if I even right now, if I go to the if I, those was watching, I have a full. I'm trying to get a basically a full uh, Paul Bunyan beard here. <laughs> I, if I if I go to the airport, I'm going. Listen, guys, I get it. <laughs> I get it. That's so, right. Yeah. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Just a couple minutes left. Um, really enjoyed the conversation. Like I said, it's a little bit of a deviation than what we normally do, but I think it was some really good hey. conversation here and, and really right. it's all it, about it, movies. It, it fits and the Hollywood. title. There was exactly. definitely a crime committed. Here. Yeah, there <laughs> Several was. Several crimes from the top down. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, let's hope that we as a society can put that behind us and allow people to express their beliefs um, without being persecuted and prosecuted um, because we're all about freedom of speech and, right. and believing what you want. Just, you know, you don't necessarily uh, want to force those beliefs on others, but you have the right and the freedom to believe what you want to believe. And, Amen. Yeah. You know, I'd like to give a tip of the hat real quick to Edward Morrow because he was the one that basically took on McCarthy and it cost him, you know, but he, t- that's, uh, you were talking about Trumbo the movie, Good Night and Good, uh, good Luck. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's I a haven't movie. seen it, but yeah, it's a great movie. I heard it's good. Yeah, it talks about that. So, yeah. Yeah, and again, I just want to really stress that if you haven't seen Trumbo, I know it kind of flew under the radar when it came out. I went to go see it because of its Hollywood connections at the time. I was, you know, looking for movies like uh, Hail Caesar and stuff right. like that, yes. which also touched on those <laughs> yeah. things. We didn't even acknowledge Hail Caesar. That's, That's right. another one that That's right. touched on the Hollywood blacklist of that era. So uh, go out and check out these movies and educate yourself. It's it's really fascinating. And, and, and you know, you may have an opinion of someone from that period, and then when you learn about them, you might come away with a different opinion about right. certain certain people from sure. that period you know joe real quick uh i think we have an announcement right because uh next our next episode is going to be covering we're going to be taking a little bit of a extra week because maryland that's oh. right so blonde it, when is that premiering again i know there i saw someone post on social media that uh they were attending a, a premiere in a movie theater so there are people who have seen it um, when is it premiere uh, on? I, I believe twenty first. I I believe it was the 29th. Okay, 29th. Okay, but anyway. Oh, 28th, 28th, Yeah. Okay, so th- that would be th- uh, Wednesday the twenty eighth. Okay. Um, so when we return, it, it it is supposedly getting limited release. Uh, I think in New York and L A. So yeah. So the, the the word will start spreading amongst us commoners. Yeah, and I did read one encouraging comment where someone said. Um, uh, What's what's the actress's name that plays Anna Marilyn? Darmus. Anna Darmus. Anna Darmus. She, the, the 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 sentence that I read said that she achieved her goal of becoming Marilyn, and that intrigued me. I was like, yeah, I, yeah, okay. That was I, I heard she's a mind. she's a chameleon in it, so that's, wow, that's cool. Yep. Wow. Looking forward right. to it. So next time we get together, we're gonna take a look at Marilyn and maybe some other platinum blondes of that era. Yes. And, uh, bring our theories to the table as to what really happened. I think there's as much controversy surrounding Maryland's death as there is JFK. Can't wait. Can't wait. So uh-huh. when we return, that's what we're going to talk about. I've been looking forward to that. So Me too. Thanks for listening. Thank you, guys. I'm Joe Hollywood. 
Imagine those people. I'm walkerandrew24 at gmail.com. There's that fancy nickname.